Uh, If you have a Bible with you this morning, I invite you to open up to Acts chapter 2. We're going to be primarily in Acts 2 this morning. Um, And welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad that you are with us as well. So before we jump into our passage today, um, I want to just take a minute and pause and acknowledge what's happening on the other side of the world and just take a minute and pray for Ukraine. I think when we find ourselves watching on the news what's happening on the other side of the world, it can like, create in us a whole mix of emotions between like, that's not okay, that's not right, there's something I should do, all the way to like, but I feel really disconnected from that and it doesn't affect my daily life, so how do I make sense of that? And I think in the midst of wherever you land on that spectrum, the thing that we can do and the thing that I think the scriptures call us to do is to simply to acknowledge it, but bring it to the Lord in prayer. Because there's oftentimes we face things in our world that just seem really too big for us to do anything about. But the thing that we can do is pray. And even in those places where it feels like, what am I supposed to pray? How am I supposed to pray? How am I supposed to make sense of that? We can always pray the scriptures. We can always pray the Psalms. And so what I'm going to do this morning is just offer up a prayer for Ukraine from Psalm 121 and 122. So pray with me. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Ukraine will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The Lord will not harm you by day. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm, and he will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. We pray for the peace of Ukraine. May those who love you be secure. May their peace within your walls and be there with the security within your citadels. For the sake of our family and friends in Ukraine, we will say, peace be with you. For the sake of the country of Ukraine, Lord, we ask that you would bring peace. And so, Lord, this morning we are lifting up a country that is um, just overrun with chaos, a country that is probably in deep distress and despair. And we ask, Lord, that you would bring healing to their land. We think of the vision at the end of the Old Testament where it says that spears and shields will be pounded into plowing material and tools to cultivate the land because there will be no more war. And so, Lord, we're asking that wars would cease and specifically uh, the, the strife in Ukraine. And so we lift them up to you this morning, Lord acknowledging uh, that they need you deeply. I pray this in your name. Amen. So again, if you have a Bible with you this morning, we're going to be primarily in Acts 2, looking at verse 42 through 47. If you're looking at one of the in-house Bibles in the seat back in front of you, you'll find that passage on page 1092 in that Bible. So it's been said that over the last year or so, job change and job transition has been at an all-time high. And so I'm wondering if there's anybody here this morning who has changed jobs in the last year or year and a half. We had a handful of people who did, um, yeah, in first service. And if you have gone through a job transition somewhere along the way, you've also had to sit through an interview. And with everything in our world being shifted online over the last couple years, there's a good chance that you had to do an interview online through a video call. And anybody who has done an interview through a video call knows that it's less than ideal. One of the worst interviews I ever did, meaning like I was the one being interviewed, was in 2015. I was interviewing with a church in Arizona, and it was on Skype. Does anybody remember Skype? Like Skype was a thing we used to use to call each other with video calls. And and interviews are kind of this weird interaction to begin with because they're high stakes, high pressure interactions, And somewhere along the way, you're doing this like unique dance of like trying to impress people, but yet also trying to discern, is this a place where I want to work or is this the person we want to hire? And it's, you know, somewhere along the way, what you're looking for is kind of this intangible connection. You ask the question like, will this person be a good fit? Where they click, will there be good chemistry, bringing them on our team? And sometimes that's like intangible, an intangible connection. And the interview hopefully gives clarity on whether or not that person will. 
Well, the worst interview that I did was a Wednesday night. It was in April of 2015. I was interviewing with a church in Arizona. And because we had three kids at home, right, like three years old and younger, I was like, I should probably go do this at my office. It was kind of close to bedtime when the interview was happening, and I thought to myself, better to be in my office than have the potential of a screaming kid down the hall or a kid climbing on my back during this interview. (laughs) So I, I go to my office, I set up my computer, and I'm waiting, and eventually, like, the phone number, the Skype phone number pops onto the screen, and I, I hit the green button to enter into the call, and the first thing I see is a wall of people. All right, so when, when Skype was a thing, it wasn't as though you could have uh, multiple devices on the call. It was only one device. And so you had eight people using one computer, and they all wanted to be on the screen at the same time. There was a search team of eight people, so there was a row of four people, and then another row ele- elevated just a little bit of four people. And the camera was far enough away from them that I could see the outline of them, but I couldn't really like read facial expressions. And so the guy who's leading the call says, hey, here's what we're going to do. Here's how the call is going to go. And then we jump in. But about 15 minutes into the call, the internet connection in my office just started to go wonky. And so like the communication's getting choppy, like the screen's getting fuzzy. What was initially like silhouettes of people became now like fuzzy dots on the screen. And then this guy who was a deacon at our church happened to come to church and he walks right by my office. My office had one of those windows on it. So he like pops his head in and he's like, hey, how's it going? And I'm like, I'm going to get found out. Like everybody at church is going to learn that I'm like interviewing with another church. And so I get nervous. And where answers should be really short, I start to ramble. And where answers, like, answers should have an explanation, I give one-word answers. And it's just a disaster. Like, I'm on this call, and I'm thinking to myself, I wouldn't even hire me. Like, (laughs) if I was them, I would so quickly pass on me. And finally, the call ends. I push back from my desk. I put my head between my knees, and I can just feel all of the stress and tension leave my body. And I was like, oh, I so wish that I could have a do-over. And the thing that I really wanted in the do-over was a better connection, both a better technical connection as well as a better personal connection. Because the thing that compromised that interview was connection. And I wonder if anybody here has ever felt that this morning. I wonder if you've ever felt that your connectedness somewhere along the way has impacted your effectiveness. I wonder if your connectedness has ever impacted your effectiveness, right? If you're a parent, you probably know and have experienced that you will be a more effective parent if you are deeply connected to your spouse who you're supposed to be parenting with, and you have a good connection with your kids, right? If you're an athlete and you're competing on a team, you've probably experienced that the effectiveness of your competition is increased by the connectedness you have to your team. You kind of know what you're going to do. You can anticipate where people are going to move and how it's going to work together. There's all sorts of places in our world where our connectedness impacts our effectiveness. And it's not only true with technology and parenting and sports, it's also true in your spiritual life. It's also true in your church life. The more connected you are to God, to the scriptures, and to one another, the more effective you will be in your spiritual growth, right? First Peter writes, or second Peter, I think, writes in the first chapter, like, Peter is admonishing the church to be effective and productive in their faith walk. If you're going to be effective in your spiritual journey, it's going to come with being connected. And the bedrock reality of humanity is that we all long for connection. We all crave connection because we were hardwired and created for it. And because of the last couple years, I think we're finding that our community is craving connection. This was so true at the end of first service. Like if you came in, like in between services, people were lingering here so long. Like we had to kick them out because second service is going to start. And we love that. But it illustrates that people are longing and desiring to connect. And our conviction is that the church should be a place where people find meaningful, both interpersonal and spiritual connection. And our passage today in Acts 2 casts vision 
for what that looks like and speaks to how we get it. And specifically, there are three things that it names that foster that connection. And so if you're here this morning and you're looking for connection, our invitation to you is to find it here at Meadowbrook Church. This is how our passage begins. This is Acts 2, verse 42. It says, they devoted themselves. Now, as you jump into the middle of this passage and you see those three words, they devoted themselves, it raises the question, like, who are the they? Have you ever wondered that before? Sometimes people say like, oh, you need to drink 120 ounces of water each day. That's what they say. You're like, well, well, who's the they? Like, who's out there saying that? You, You might ask that question here as well. When it says they devoted themselves, you might think, well, who are the they? And the context of this passage is that Jesus has been crucified, buried, raised from the dead, and has ascended back to heaven. And right before he ascends back to the Father, he tells the disciples, who at that point in time number about 120, to go to Jerusalem and to wait. He says, wait for 10 days until my Father pours out the Spirit. And they're like, well, what happens when the Spirit comes? It's like, oh, you, you will know. How, how will we know when the Spirit comes? Oh, trust me, you will know. Go and pray and wait. So they go back to Jerusalem, and they pray and they wait. They wait and they pray. And after about 10 days, the Spirit comes and causes revival in Jerusalem. Peter, filled with the Spirit, walks out into the streets, preaches this open-air sermon, and the response to his sermon is amazing. 3,000 people respond to a single message. They repent, they believe, they undergo baptism, and they enter in to the family of God. And so the they in this passage are the 3,000 plus the 120, and if I'm doing my math right, that's 3,120 disciples. Did I get that right? Yeah, thank you. Good. Now, because this group has just undergone significant life transformation, they are now like giving themselves over to the things that have caused that transformation, right? So it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, which at the very least is the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection and ascension, which is a sense started this movement to recreate and renew the world And us as recipients of the gospel are part of that. It could also be a reference to the teachings of Jesus that we read in the gospel accounts and could also refer to the Old Testament scriptures because the New Testament had not been written yet and specifically how Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship which oftentimes in church circles, we think of that as like potlucks after church or or picnics in the park, which that's part of it. But the Greek word here communicates a whole lot more than just a church meal. It creates, it, it communicates partnership and deep connection and an intertwining of your life with someone else's life. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, the breaking of bread, which could be an outworking of fellowship, which could be referenced to just simply a meal, could also be a reference to the Lord's Supper, this commemorative meal remembering the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it says they devoted themselves to prayer. So what we see from this community is initially that they are a devoted community devoting themselves to these four things. And when you put these four things together, it seems to indicate that they devoted themselves to a certain way of life. They prioritized a communal sort of life above anything else. They they devoted themselves to digging in deep into the scriptures and learning more and more about who Jesus was and what that means for their everyday life and how they are called to live. It seems like they put that at the center and then ordered and prioritized the rest of their life around that. And we are living in a time when people are prioritizing all sorts of things before the church, even people in the church. And we have to ask ourselves the question, yeah, what am I devoting myself to? Like, what is the thing that is kind of the organizing center of my life? And if I'm a Christian, like, is it Jesus? Is it living in community with other people? Or is that like a a tangential afterthought that I just kind of fit into the margins of my life? Or do I say, that's going to be the organizing reality of my life? 
And, and what the scriptures say is that as this group of people devoted themselves to living this way, what they experienced was awe and amazement. It says in verse 43, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. See, as they ordered themselves around the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of the bread, and prayer, like they were filled with awe and wonder. Like as you continue to read through the book of Acts, like the apostles were doing some amazing things. In the very next chapter, Peter is going to be walking into the temple and see a guy who was lame from birth, never used his legs before. And Peter says, hey, I don't have any money to give you, but what I do have is much better. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. And he says, stand up and walk. And the guy does never having used his legs before. You go to chapter 5, like it says that people were crowding around Peter, hoping to just fall under his shadow because apparently his shadow was healing people, hoping that his shadow would heal them too. You find that there are stories of miraculous escapes from prison. All sorts of wonderful things were happening in the early church, and everyone was amazed by them. Now, I'm going to guess us here this morning I've never seen anybody healed by a shadow, right? I've never healed anybody with my shadow, not to my knowledge, right? I'm going to guess you haven't been either. If I were to say to you, hey, just go stand in somebody's shadow and it will cure your disease, you're like, I'm going to go to the hospital. Thanks, Brian, right? But I think what we have seen in our church and what I continue to see in our church is that our church really knows how to be the church. I can remember my first interview here, like my first in-person group interview, coming for a weekend visit back in 2016, sitting around a table in somebody's home. The search committee was there, and a comment that somebody said to me was that Meadowbrook Church shows up. When there is a need, when there is a gathering, when there is something going on, Meadowbrook Church shows up. And that might not sound all that spectacular, right? as compared to somebody being healed by a shadow. But when you're in crisis and somebody shows up at your front door with a meal and says a prayer with you and says, we're going to walk with you, that's wildly significant. When you have just lost a loved one and you find yourself like totally disoriented about how am I going to make it from one day to the next, and there's a community of people around you saying, we're going to carry you through this, that might be more significant than any sort of miraculous sign and wonder you could see or experience. And I've witnessed in my five and a half years of being a pastor here that Meadowbrook Church does that. Meadowbrook Church shows up when there's a need, when there's a thing, when there's somebody who's in crisis. It's a community that knows how to be the church. And and what Acts 2 is saying is that not only was the early church a devoted church, the other thing it says is that they were a caring church. This is what we read in verse 44. It says, All the believers were together, and they had everything in common, which kind of speaks to this idea of a certain mindset. They had a certain mindset about how they view the world and how they viewed themselves in the world, and that mindset spilled over into how they understood their money and their stuff. Because it says this in verse 45, They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. They, they were a caring community and gave of their stuff. They understood that their money and their stuff wasn't necessarily theirs, and they had a very radical mindset around it. You read in chapter 4 of Acts, this is chapter 4, verse 32, that no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything that they had. See, the mindset that they had about their stuff and their property and their money was that my stuff doesn't belong to me. It's not actually my stuff, which came from a belief that God owns everything. But it says in the Psalms that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God owns everything. It's all his. It's all from him, for him, and through him. It's all his. And because God is a good and gracious God, because he is merciful and kind and he cares about his people, he's going to ensure that everybody has everything they need. So therefore, that leads us to a practice of generosity, that I can give of my stuff freely, that I can share it with other people. I don't have to keep it all to myself, 
Why? Because God is going to care for my need. And so the mindset that they had, you could say it this way, was about stewardship rather than ownership. They saw that this is God's stuff. God has given it to me for a season. I'm called to be a steward of it, and therefore it's not really mine so I can freely share it, knowing that I'm participating and partnering with God in his work in the world. And I think when you look at that mentality and that mindset as compared to the mindset of our world, we find that it's very different. It's a very different way of viewing stuff in our world because I would say the cultural context in which we live, the mindset is like, my stuff is mine. I worked for it. I earned it. It belongs to me, and I will be the one who decides what happens with it, right? Which comes from this belief that there's only so much to go around. The the other underlying belief there about God is that God is distant and detached, and he's not going to really care for me. I have to care for myself and be self-sufficient, so my stuff is mine, and the practice that flows from that mindset and belief is stockpiling and greed, And if I'm honest, I see that at work in my own life. I see that surface from time to time that what I've earned is mine, and I don't necessarily have to share it with anyone. And earlier this year, it was a uh, Saturday afternoon back in September, I found that mindset really play itself out in my life. It was a Saturday afternoon, late September, beautiful Saturday afternoon. The neighborhood kids were outside, our kids were outside, I was working on our backyard, and in the distance we heard from a child's perspective one of the most amazing sounds you could ever hear. The twinkling and the dingling music of an ice cream truck like coming through the neighborhood. I don't even know if my kids have ever seen an ice cream truck in our neighborhood before, but they quickly figured out that's what that was, right? They all like, it was like in unison. All the kids from all the backyards came out to the sidewalk, and they're like, ice cream! And so I grabbed some cash. I'm like, yeah, we got to get ice cream. Like, why not? We, we go down. The ice cream truck stops at the corner of our block. I'm there with our kids. We're looking at, you know, all the stuff. And then, like, I turn around, and there's this group of kids around me. And there are no other adults, <laughs> right? And these kids did not bring money with them. And what they do is they look to the one tall person who has the money, and they're like, hey, can I get this? Can I get this? Hey, I want this. And I'm like, where are your parents? Like, do you not have money? And so I had a $20 bill, and I'm like, I got to get something for my kids. I got to get something for my wife. And like, these things are like, you know, not like a dollar, not 50 cents. They're like three or four dollars. And like, all of these kids are like saying, I want this, I want that. And internal, there's like, I should send these kids home to go get their own money. Like, this is not my responsibility. But then at the same time, I'm like, but yet I have more money. I only had a 20 in my hand, but my house was two houses down, and I was like, I I could go back and get another 20. And truth be told, like, I have enough money where I could get all of these kids three rounds of ice cream. Like, maybe I should, and then send them home and say, this is what happens when your kids don't come to the ice cream truck with money, right? Internally, there was this wrestle that, like, I don't have to care for these other kids. They're not my kids. Like, truth be told, I I know all these kids. Like, they're in and out of our house or in and out of our backyard. I love these kids. But even still, there's this wrestle of, like, this isn't my responsibility to feed them ice cream. But what I have to do in those moments when that happens, it's like I have to coach myself through those moments. Like, I have to have this internal dialogue where I say, Brian, remember, God is gracious. And he has blessed you, and he's given you more than you need. You do have another 20 in the house, and you actually can get everybody ice cream two times over. So what you need to do is you need to position yourself where you are called to be generous, even when it fights against your impulse to hoard and stockpile, because in that, God's grace works in you and through you to bless other people. And the early church did that all the time. They were a devoted community. They were a caring community. They gave of themselves freely, and not only that, but they were also a together community. We read this in verse 46. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. You see twice in verse 46 that it says intentionally that they were together. If you were to back up to verse 44, you would find another reference of how they were regularly together. And in this moment, it names two spaces. 
in which they existed together. The first, it says, was the temple. They met together in the temple courts, which is a reference to the temple in Jerusalem. That's still where they are in the context of this story. And if you keep reading into chapter 3, it says in verse 1 of chapter 3, one day John and Peter were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon, indicating that they regularly met. They met daily, specifically at a time, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, which further illustrates how they devoted themselves to prayer because they were going to the temple to pray. They regularly met at the temple. The other place it mentions that they met together was in homes. It says that they met in each other's homes, breaking bread together. Again, further communicating and illustrating the devotion to breaking of bread. So it, it communicates how they met with this rhythm of meeting both in private and public spaces. That the church gathered in a large group was equally significant as the church scattered in smaller groups in homes. And I think this is an important word for the church because over the last couple of years, we have been like forced to scatter. We've been forced to isolate, and there's good reason for that. But it seems like as we're coming out of these last two years, there's this place of like, am I just going to get comfortable with that? Am I going to get comfortable with staying alone, staying by myself, just kind of retreating back to my space because it's comfortable there rather than saying like, no, I, I need to be in community. I need to be together with people because the truth is you can't fully experience God on your own. You just can't. Because God is a community in and of himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the call is for us to be together. We are created to be together. Like the one thing in the creation account, if you go back to Genesis 1 and 2, that God says is not good. Because all through Genesis 1 and 2, God is creating something and he's calling it good. The next day passes, he creates something and he calls it good. The one thing he says is not good is for humanity to be alone. It is not good for humanity to be alone. You were created to experience God in community, meaning you can't fully experience God without community. You also can't fully and faithfully bear witness to God and bear witness to his love in the world without community. You can't fully bear witness to who God is without other people. The call of this passage is to be connected. And as you do, you will be more effective, right? It's simply this call that the church is most effective when it's deeply connected. The church is best on mission with God when it's operating in the place of deep connected relationships because the way that this passage ends in verse 47 is this, and the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. See, connection doesn't just magically happen. It takes intention. It takes devotion. It takes the ability to sacrificially give of yourself to others and to prioritize each other above yourself. And when this early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking the bread, and prayer, like the world saw that, like, wow, look at the way they care for each other. Look at the way they love each other. L look at the way they are intentional about being together. Like, I want in on that. As we live life in community together, it enables us to most effectively bear witness to the world. The church is most effective when it's deeply connected. It, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, that the call of the church is to be the light of the world. It's the metaphor that he uses to describe what the church is supposed to do, to light up the darkness in our world. We can't be the light of the world individually. We are called to be the light of the world collectively. And when we are, we shine so much brighter in a dark world that needs guidance, that needs hope, that needs wisdom, and we can offer that. And we do that through an invitation to say, come and be a part of what God is doing in and through us here as a church. As we kind of conclude this series today, the call, it's a reminder to us that the call of Jesus 
is to be rooted in community. And that happens through serving, right? We talked about that in the first couple weeks. Serving either in kids' ministry, serving on the hospitality team. It happens through the context of caring for others. We talked about that last week as we highlighted the care team. As we've been moving through this series, we've been highlighting different ministries. And today we're highlighting the ministry of neighborhood communities, of gathering in small to mid-sized groups with people in our church to help build relationships so that you can be more deeply connected ultimately so we can be effective in being the light of the world.